Okay. Uh, good, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I think that we could get started. I'm sure that there are uh, people who are in the meeting right now, and there are a lot of people who are actually watching us on YouTube. So we could get started. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good morning and to those in the Eastern time, and good night, uh, good afternoon to those in other time zones. Uh, my name is June. I'm the co-chair of the MSU Undergraduate Committee in Global Thought. Uh, David Chen, uh, also here in the meeting as well, is our other co-chair of the UCGT. Before we begin our talk with Mr. Tim Huang, I want to give a short introduction about the UCGT. UCGT is the undergraduate arm of the Committee on Global Thought, led by, organized by, and promoted by undergraduate students. The UCGT brings together undergraduate students interested in engaging issues of global relevance and involves them in the interdisciplinary work of the Committee of Global Thought, the events and initiatives. Past events that we've hosted include litigating human rights, where we brought together human rights lawyers working in diverse fields of civil rights, immigration, and economic justice to talk about their career. We are also hosting our series from the local to the global, a sequence of talks, where we invite experts on global issues and see how the global issues affect on the local level. For those who are interested in the future UCT events or want to get involved, we will send out a link to our listserv at the end of the talk. Also, before we begin, uh, I want to address that any questions that the audience has so far can be asked through the Q&A function of the Zoom webinar. Now, I will move on to introducing Mr. Tim Wong, the guest speaker of today. Tim is currently the founder and CEO of Fiscal Note. The company owns media and news company uh, CQ Roll Call Group, which acquired from the Economist Group in 2018 and creates a technology a platform that combines award-winning journalism along with products and services to provide access to large quantities of data, news, and analysis for all levels of government. The global company with offices across DC, New York City, Baton Rouge, Seoul, and India and Brussels is the largest privately held company in the legal analytics and reg tech space and powers over 4,000 of the world's largest and most influential corporations, associations, nonprofits, law firms. And it creates a more open and transparent society through data. With Hong's technology and capital partners from the likes of Mark Cuban, Jerry Young, Steve Case, NEA, Renren, and others, Fiscal Note is revolutionary, revolutionizing across legislation, regulation, and court cases for organizations all around the world. Now I will move on to Mr. Tim Huang when he will give his opening remarks. Great. Uh, well, I appreciate everybody, uh, you know, uh, kind of joining in and listening to. Uh, this conversation, hopefully it'll be somewhat uh, enlightening um, and uh, I'll try and make it as uh, uh, as entertaining as possible. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, just a little bit about Fiscal Note and how we got started and kind of the work that we do. Um, you know, Fiscal Note, you know, we are uh, a late stage technology startup um, that really is sitting at the intersection of technology, politics, um, and the law. Um, so as June mentioned, uh, you know, our core products, what we do is we aggregate uh, legislation, regulations, uh, court cases, government filings, government documents from uh, multiple different jurisdictions around the world. So dozens of different countries uh, from North America to uh, Europe to Latin America, you know, Southeast Asia. Um, we digitize, uh, you know, hundreds of millions, if not billions of, of legal documents. Uh, every year, um, kind of structure, normalize, and classify th that information using uh, natural language processing, machine learning uh, capabilities, and then kind of build uh, software capabilities specifically for um, government agencies, uh, law firms, corporations, nonprofits, um, and the public to be able to access those laws and really understand how laws and regulations are impacting society. Um, so. And one of the cool things that we have the opportunity to do as an organization is, like I said, sort of sit at this intersection between technology uh, and politics. Um, and, you know, our technologies are used uh, abundantly across uh, multiple different uh, uh, kind of uh, use cases, right? So everything from uh, research to, uh, you know, kind of uh, legal practice to uh, political activism. 
Um, and, you know, certainly 2020 has been a very interesting year. Um, you know, many of our clients have been, uh, you know, using our platforms for monitoring things like, uh, you know, regulatory changes um, as a result of shutdowns, economic stimulus uh, packages, um, uh, and certainly, you know, even some of the, um, this, the social issues that have popped up um, uh, that have really come to the forefront in the last couple of months around things like uh, racial injustices, social inequality, um, and the like. You know, many of our organizations have been trying to uh, navigate through, um, you know, many, uh, the, the many increasing kind of um, requirements that are kind of being put on them from a legal as well as from a political perspective. Um, similarly, I think, you know, we think a lot about kind of how our technologies are used um, in the context of the political system. And, you know, the mission of our company uh, kind of is very simple, which is to connect the world to their governments. So we create software and tools to be able to help, um, you know, organizations and agencies and companies and whatnot um, really connect better uh, to the political system, whether that's uh, monitoring legislation and regulations or, you know, following different appropriations or really looking at how laws and regulations may potentially impact um, their citizens and the constituencies that they represent. Um, and so, um, you know, we, we think a lot about the ethics of kind of the work that we're doing, um, the ethics of artificial intelligence and its use cases, uh, particularly, you know, with respect to um, some of the, uh, 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 you know, kind of more nefarious characters that, that are kind of operating in, at, the, at the intersections of politics and technology. Um, and then particularly as, as it pertains to elections. Uh, now, while fiscal doesn't do any specific work around elections, you know, we do power the policy understandings of um, uh, uh, most uh, political actors across the political ecosystem, uh, both political parties in the United States, uh, both presidential candidates are customers of ours. So we help them understand what's going on in Congress, um, the regulatory agencies, um, you know, the court systems and the like. Um, and so we view ourselves as suppliers of information you know, to facilitate uh, uh, democratic processes. Um, and so um, we do think a lot about, um, you know, what, what role do, do facts and information play, you know, in the broader ecosystem? How does policy impact um, uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, the policymaking process um, and how uh, and what role does um, uh, technology and information play in those markets? And so, um, you know, super excited to be here. Um, uh, you know, fiscal note, I, uh, you know, just one, one, one note. Uh, I started the company about um, six, seven years ago, straight out of college, straight out of undergrad. And, uh, you know, as, as June mentioned, it's been certainly a wild ride, you know, as we've kind of built this company to where it is today. Um, and super excited to kind of talk about um, any of the talks that I just mentioned. Thank you. Thank you for the opening remarks. Uh, now I'll try to move on to the uh, straight uh, to our moderator discussion. Uh, so the first question that I want to ask you is this. Uh, the topic of this uh, talk today is called democracy and AI, uh, civics in a new age. And in spirit of that, how do you think that AI and technology and especially AI is shaping the 2020 election? And do you have any like particular concerns you might have? And do you know if anything that fiscal note is doing to deal with those issues? Well, I think that, you know, the fundamental issue around, um, uh, you know, the artificial intelligence um, in elections fundamentally comes down to this topic about information and how information is delivered to citizens. Um, uh, you know, what information that they have around facts, around policies, around even things like the electoral process. Um, I know that this the, the last couple of news cycles have been dominated by procedural elements of of the voting process, right? So, um, you know, who's allowed to vote early? You know, what what is it going to take to to mail in your ballot? Um, who's eligible for voting? Um, uh, you know, uh, what does early voting look like? Um, you know, all, all these different things. And so, you know, if, if you recall back to 26, uh, 2016, um, the big story of the day, of course, was misinformation, right? So um, to the extent that, you know, foreign actors or individual actors or, or, or nefarious actors um, leveraged um, uh, kind of core elements of our social media networks and, and the like uh, to be able to navigate, um, you know, engagement algorithms and, and whatnot uh, to manipulate the outcomes of, of elections, 
Um, the primary mechanism for doing so was was built off of um, you know a couple of different elements, right? So number one was um, a coordinated ele- uh, 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 kind of campaign to uh, you know, disinform the public around uh, things like voter registration deadlines, right? So um, uh, there's a patchwork, you know, uh, in the United States, for instance, because we have a patchwork of regulations that are regulated primarily at the state level on elections, um, you know, the opportunity to run targeted misinformation campaigns is very high. Um, the second is the lack of accountability, you know, of of our kind of technological systems, um, you know, primarily uh, many of which kind of deliver information algorithmically uh, to be able to contain and constrain um, disinformation is 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 certainly very high. Um, and, and that's been obviously a, 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 a key area where, you know, many um, lawmakers and regulators are kind of stepping in here. Um, and I think the last is just around the concept of what is true, and what isn't true, um, you know, in the political kind of civic sphere, um, you know, the ability to kind of navigate through, uh, you know, what is factual, what isn't factual, um, and the ability to kind of use um, artificial intelligence, both for productive purposes in terms of fact checking, uh, but also for nefarious purposes in terms of um, continuing to spread disinformation or um, algorithmically um, ride off of kind of more bombastic or uh, or um, uh, a kind of yellow journalism type of approaches to kind of driving sensationalism. Um, so if you remember kind of uh, the stories in 2016 around, um, you know, Pizzagate and, and things like that. So these these are pretty uh, you know, sensationalist stories that are obviously untrue, uh, but uh, uh, but were, were primarily algorithmic and driven. And so, you know, I think that, you know, there's there's been so much that's already been set, said about it that I don't really want to kind of, I don't have to delve into it too much, but um, ultimately what it comes down to is, you know, have things changed since 2016? Um, I think that things have changed. Um, you know, I think that the the platforms by which information is spread or are spread, um, you know, uh, have, um, if anything, there's a lot more spotlight and attention to the deficiencies that exist on the platforms. Um, and there's a lot more accountability, both political as well as societal accountability, uh, to be able to rein in our, our current ecosystems. Um, is the system perfect? No. Um, you know, will it ever be perfect? Uh, unsure. Um, but I think when it comes down to it, uh, you know, uh, it's certainly better than where it was in 2016. Um, and certainly when it comes to, you know, things that I worry about, um, you know, those are primarily kind of the elements that, that kind of drive elections, right? I mean, you know, a lot of people think that elections are very complicated. I, you know, I think um, just a little bit, my, I, June mentioned, I, I, I'd worked in previous campaigns. I, one of my first jobs was actually working in uh, Obama's uh, 2008 presidential campaign. And elections are quite simple. You know, it's, a, it's fundamentally about people going to the ballot box and, and, you know, pressing their candidate and, and turning in their ballot. Um, and, you know, to the extent that, you know, people are disenfranchised or, um, or, or misinformed about their ability to get to the ballot box and, and submit their, their ballots, um, you know, that's where the challenges are. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that that, that, that's the fundamental issue uh, that hopefully we'll, we'll see some positive improvements on. And I think that your response uh, actually brings up to the second, uh, question that I have in sense that algorithms are fundamentally for people who are using algorithms, you know, people not, might not know okay, what might be the inherent reasoning behind them. And it can lead to cases where people might believe that the AR is a feasible target given that it's, a, its definition of fairness might not be intuitive to a lot of people. So in terms of that particular issue, uh, Recently, uh, a lot of there's been uh, cases where courts has been using uh, AI in their uh, bail for us, for example. So given the past and the current use of AI in court, do you think that AI and the algorithmic uh, elements to it could actually uh, uh, lead to inherently discriminatory practices? Yes. Um... So I think that um, you know there's a kind of recent trend and movement around things like um, uh, you know automated regulations or sentencing. Um, I, I don't think that um, we're ever going to get to a place where um, you know artificial intelligence is is going to be able to make um, 
uh, case by case, uh, you know, factual judgment calls. Um, you know, maybe in the case of like traffic or something, or something. I mean, even traffic is a, you know, that's there's there's so many individual facets of, of kind of application of law that. Um, but you know, to your point, you know, there have been places around things like sentencing um, where there have been experimentation around, um, uh, you know, the use of artificial intelligence in the law. Um, I, I, th- I, it's it's hard for me to imagine that um, those systems are inherently going to be non-discriminatory. Um, and the reason why I say that is because our current systems are inherently discriminatory. There's quite a large amount of institutional, um, uh, uh, you know, kind of bias, um, you know, in our current uh, judicial and political systems. Um, and if you really think about sort of how, um, you know, what how artificial intelligence works, it's about kind of, you know, bu- using existing data sets uh, to be able to build uh, models of um, society so that we can efficiently work through those models and create um, outcomes. Um, and so if your inherent data sets that are going into those models are biased um, or have some sort of um, uh, a bent in terms of, of, for instance, you know, having underrepresented minorities, having tougher sentencing, um, you know, than, than Caucasians and, and the like, then you know, what your algorithms are going to do is basically two things. Number one is they're just going to reinforce, um, you know, the existing uh, kind of um, systems that are in place. But secondarily, um, you know, people are going to paper over the institutional problems with kind of this techno utopia um, element um, that justifies uh, kind of technological um, uh, superiority in terms of, of, you know, institutional bias. Um, so, uh, you know, fundamentally, I think, you know, we're thinking a lot about, you um, how do we take the bias out of our systems, um, you know, to create more qualitative understandings of, of the world? Um, you know, I'll give you a good example. You know, at FiscalNet, one of the things we think a lot about is um, how effective is a lawmaker, right? So, um, you know, to be a, an effective lawmaker, um, does it mean that you pass the most legislation, um, that you introduce a bunch of laws that get passed and, and whatnot? Or, um, does it mean that you stopped a lot of things that could have been passed, um, right? And so depending on your view of government, um, right, whether it's government as a solution, um, you know, as a, as a, uh, as a, as a problem solver, um, or government as an institution that needs to get smaller, um, your definition of effectiveness um, is very different. Um, and so, um, you know, those are the types of things where even we're, as we're making political judgments around how effective is Senate or so-and-so, um, you know, um, we have to watch ourselves in terms of how we think about how our algorithms represent that effectiveness um, and what it means for a political bi- bias perspective to be able to reflect that. Then considering uh, what you said, in a sense, one thing that we haven't talked about, at least for today, is that the automa- uh, an automation algorithm thinking algorithms will not only affect, in a sense, uh, policy and politics, but also economics. Uh, the change in AI will have on economics will be uh, historical, in a sense that the automation would definitely change a lot of the jobs that we are having right now. For example, truck drivers is the biggest number of jobs throughout the entire America, yet that might be the a most likely job that could be automated. So considering this in hand, how do you think that uh, in the era of global capital and global data, is democracy sustainable? It's a very heavy question. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, well, let's, let's just take the United States as an example. Um, you know, I'm of the philosophy that, uh, well, you know, putting aside my own political beliefs, um, the Republican Party is in in very deep trouble. Um, you know, just taking a step back, right? Um, you know, if and this this is just a fact, right? Um, putting aside 2004, um, which I would argue is kind of a, a little bit of a fluke because of 9/11 and and, and the war in Afghanistan and the like. Um, the GOP has consistently lost the popular vote for the presidency um, since 1988. Um, and, uh, you know, it's largely because, you know, they've been sort of 
grouping, um, uh, you know, they have, they have, they have a minority problem. They have a young people problem. Um, and it's inevitable that the political system is going to get more fragmented, um, as you know, kind of the, uh, vocal majority, you know, slowly becomes the minority, you know, um, over the course of the next 15, 20, 30 years. Now, um, exacerbating that problem, um, is an economic one that you pointed out. Uh, which is an economic problem. Um, and, you know, the vast level of automation, technological investment, um, you know, and the like uh, that, are, that are going into our economic system um, is just structurally eliminating jobs. I mean, um, you know, and, you know, a lot of people probably disagree with me and I understand that. Uh, but the reality is that, you know, just go ask somebody in Ohio or in Michigan, um, you know, or whatever, you know, where they used to require 10,000 people or, you know, 5,000 people to build, you know, a certain number of cars. And now they require 200 people, you know, pressing buttons and, you know, working with some robots side by side. Right. So, um, or, you know, ask the folks that used to work, you know, frontline service jobs um, and now replaced by, you know, kiosks at McDonald's. Right. So um, the reality is that we are entering into a kind of um, CapEx oriented society as opposed to an OpEx oriented society. Um, that means is that for businesses, it's much cheaper um, in a you know low interest rate environment, um, you know to um, you know invest in uh, you know capital um, that returns um, you know uh, productivity over an extended period of time, especially if it's um, algorithmically driven, never gets tired, um, you know is not subject to you know benefits and, and the like, as opposed to an opex oriented society that you know invests in our people and the like. So. Um, what it, what it fundamentally means, I guess, is that, um, you know, when it, uh, you combine these two issues, right, sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, a fragmented political system, you know, where you have sort of racial injustices and, you know, one party kind of backing itself into a corner, another party trying to kind of take it or cap capitalize on that. Um, and then an economic system um, where um, you have effectively, you know, kind of a technologically driven uh, fragmentation of, of um uh, of kind of economic hierarchy, um, you're inevitably going to lead to uh, political fissures um, in society. And, um, you know, ideally, you know, the democratic process should um, take into account technological changes. Um, you know, certainly, you know, the current technological change that we're going through is not the only technological change that the United States has gone through in its, you know, almost, you know, 300 whatever year history. You know, the Industrial Revolution, um, you know, we saw, uh, you know, certainly a lot of progressive movements, um, you know, to actually make the country more democratic, right? So, you know, things like the direct election of senators, um, you know, the enfranchisement of, of uh, eventually of women and, and you know, and, and after that, minorities and the like. And so things like that, I think um, I'm hopeful that um, our systems will become more democratic in the future. Um, uh, but the country will have to navigate through some pretty uh, tough challenges from an economic and socioeconomic perspective. Um, and that's, um, uh, you know, and, and just to circle up on that point, um, you know, in the late 19th century, the early 20th century, you know, as the, as the United States is going through these, these, these challenges, it's not like there wasn't any unrest, right? I mean, um, you know, as a result of the industrial revolution, um, there was massive unrest, um, you know, among the, the, the population, the general population. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, certainly, um, you know, I, I don't think that we're going to be immune from some of those challenges here. All right. Now, speaking of the political process, um, I want to bring up a short uh, biographical note. Um, we actually met together at a talk back in Korea this summer. And I remember during your talk, you mentioned that you mentioned your Princeton uh, undergraduate year where you were first interested in becoming, uh, becoming involved in politics and getting uh, joining politics. Then you realize that technology is a 21st century way of making change in the world. So that's how you pivoted from politics towards technology. Taking that into consideration, do you think that, and then this is uh, in line with the previous question that I had before, do you think that like the U current US political system what are the ways maybe you could do to change to keep up date with these rapid changes in automation? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, the I think the conversation that's going on across the systems right now, uh, or across the, the population around some of these topics is is quite um, substantial, right? So we're now having these conversations, understanding that um, technology and automation, you know, are playing a significant and pivotal role in our economy. Um, you know, number one, um, you know, I think is is uh, a general sense of political awareness that this is an issue. Um, I think that there's a very strong desire um, on uh, you know, political parties, on the political party parts to kind of point fingers at individuals, right? So if you are on the right, you know, you point your fingers at the immigrants, you know, if you're on the left, you, fo- you point your fingers at, um, you know, the, the billionaires, but u- ultimately, you know, the way I see it is, um, um, you know, labor displacement as a result of automation is, is quite a significant issue that um, isn't getting enough attention. Um, and it's probably going to be at, to your point, you know, around things like truck drivers and the like, um, you know, a significant driver of, of, um, structural economic, um, change. And so we need more political technological business leaders to talk, uh, up, um, you really, um, you know, uh, bring this to the attention of individuals and, um, and really think about sort of how to, how to create solutions. I think the second around, um, uh, uh around these things is, is really thinking about, what is the role of the government, um, you know, uh, as, as, as a result of these kind of technological changes, right? So there's a lot of talk, for instance, around uh, universal basic income. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of talk about, you know, what is the role of, of um, you know, things like, uh, you know, organizations like the Labor Department in terms of, um, you know, shifting skill sets and whatnot for the American public. Um, uh, you know, how do we think about sort of visionary ways of, of um, leveraging the institutions that we have in government, um, you know, to be able to um, really help, um, you know, millions of Americans navigate through these challenges. And you're seeing a little bit of that right now through COVID-19, right? So um, the uh, unemployment insurance um, that was extended to, you know, millions and millions of Americans during this time, um, you know, effectively just paying them out, you know, $600 a week, um, you know, is one form of, of kind of institutional ways in which we're seeing um, government really step into to challenges to to um, to labor, um, and so that infrastructure that we're developing here, I think, is is going to be critical as we think about um, you know what uh, what it means to be um, uh, a citizen, you know, in kind of a large point of economic displacement. Um, and I think the last is is you know from a private sector perspective, um, as somebody who who builds you know kind of AI technologies and works with clients who are implementing them and the like. I think there's a heavy level of focus on um, efficiency and cost savings. Um, you know, there's not a lot of questions around humanity um, and, uh, you know, the ability to kind of insert some of those, those discussion points, I think is, is critical um, in terms of really thinking about, you know, really what are the implications of what I'm, uh, uh, what I'm implementing um, and uh, how do I mitigate any kind of negative, um, uh, kind of aspects to, uh, uh, to my employees or to my vendors or my customers and, and be able to kind of implement those over time. Got it. Okay. Thank you. So this is the, all the questions I have prepared and I'll try to like get if there has been any audience uh, questions so far. So I actually been asked about two questions regarding the last one you made. Uh, so the first question that I got is that, U.S. What U.S. did basically in response to COVID uh, was basically uh, paying money, in a sense, to a lot of its unemployment benefits. Uh, for other countries, uh, we're also seeing a rapid shift in technology and automation. Do you see any different response from its democratic or non-democratic leaders in regards to automation? You mean beyond the United States? Yep. You know, I think that, um, you know, this is a universal trend that we're seeing, you know, kind of globally here. Now, you know, you can kind of hide some of the, um, the immediate effects of, of um, automation with globalization um, and labor arbitrage. So um, it's a lot of fancy words for basically saying outsourcing. <laughs> uh, but ultimately, you know, if you are, um, uh, if you're a business leader right now, um, you've, you've got a couple different options if you want to lower cost um, uh, and increase profitability, right? I mean, that's fundamentally what shareholders, shareholders are driving you to do. So um, number one is you just think about it. Um, 
uh, think about this way. Let's say you're making a, a toy um, and you know, you're manufacturing that toy, you know, in, in Texas. Um, now you've got two options to lower your costs. You know, number one is you create a factory um, that basically, you know, uses computer vision, um, you know, machine learning, uh, you know, kind of robotics uh, to be able to create, you know, 10 times or 20 times more toys at half the cost. Um, it's going to require less people. Um, it's going to require, or, and it's going to increase your productivity over time. Um, the second way to do it is to basically just move all of your toy manufacturing, you know, to, you know, Guatemala or Indonesia or Southeast Asia or something. Um, and it's obviously super simplifying the problem, um, because there's obviously, you know, taxes and tariffs and, um, you know, shipping and things like that, but overall and logistics, but, um, overall, those, those are the two options that you have at your disposal. So, um, for a lot of countries, um, you know, like the United States, we are in a phase where I think because of, um, uh, kind of long-term interest rates staying fairly low, that the factory option is actually pretty attractive. You create a physical asset, um, that perpetually creates higher levels of productivity. Um, you know, that doesn't have a upward force in terms of labor, um, you know, that, that really drives, um, you know, uh, lower profitability over time. Um, for other countries, you know, that are not the United States that don't have, you know, the unlimited, you know, money machine at the Federal Reserve, um, you know, uh, you know, particularly, uh, you know, places like, uh, like Korea or, or whatnot, um, there's certainly a lot of work going on effectively, you know, in terms of outsourcing, uh, we're building more global supply chains to effectively drive down cost. Um, and so, um, now there's obviously a natural limit to it, right? I mean, eventually there's there's just nowhere to go, um, you know. And I think that's a good problem to have if the world is in a place where, um, you know, it's so expensive for us to be able to kind of um, have, uh, uh, you know, globalized supply chains in such. And at that level, what you would happen is basically the entire world to be shifting upwards in terms of um, their economic um, consumption and, and productivity, um, but. Um, but then, you know, I think, you know, the, 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 the long-term asymptote effectively is to, is to drive towards automation. Um, and, uh, and I think that's an inevitable place that where, where things are going to end up. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, that's a long way of answering that, you know, the United States is very lucky, um, you know, in terms of the optionality, in terms of the central banking system, um, in terms of kind of the capital that's available in other markets, you know, that where that those things are not available, uh, we are seeing kind of the intermix between globalization and and uh, and automation. Okay, okay, and there's about three sets of uh, questions that are in the Q and A so far. Uh, two, uh, one part of it is by Susan Ong. Do you see the role of labor unions in this automation process? And uh, in regards to that, uh, another question she, uh, Susan always asked is that do you see Biden's policy to increase made in America as realistic? Those are the two questions. Well, let me let me address the point on labor unions first a little bit. I guess um, the concept of of political organizing um, in the twenty first century is very. Uh, um, it's increasingly becoming outdated. Um, and, you know, really think about, for instance, um, the old institutions of media, um, you know, kind of traditional media, um, the old you know, political parties, uh, uh, you know, organizations like uh, political unions, you know, I, I would kind of uh, throw in there, um, you know, are, are increasingly kind of going to the wayside um, and largely because of kind of digital forms of organizing or direct candidates or, you um, or messaging that effectively um, disintermediates, um, you know, a lot of that that uh, that the power that they used to hold. Um, so, uh, you know, what does it mean in terms of things like political parties, right? So, political parties, you know, um, President Trump was obviously able to, you know, effectively um, circumvent the the RNC, the institutional kind of Republican Party and the like, in 2016, largely using his own kind of voice and his own following to kind of get to that point. Um, I think, uh, you know, the, and, and that, that, that I think is, was, not, was less a reflection actually of Donald Trump and more a reflection of, uh, the, the disintermediation of the political party and then increasing the, the sort of media apparatus that sur surrounds the political system. 
Um, I think that, um, you know, in a world where uh, uh, technology is becoming more, uh, more cheap, um, you know, as a result of kind of low interest rates um, and uh, labor is becoming more globalized and more um, agile, um, it's difficult to see labor unions increasing in political power um, as opposed to decreasing. I think at best we can sort of see um, a flattening of, of kind of political authority, you know, in kind of localized markets um, where, um, you know, we want to effectively kind of try and drive some level of, um, uh, of kind of political outcomes, I guess, um, you know, whether that's uh, economic development or, or, um, uh, or investment into a certain region, um, certainly in partnership with state and local governments and federal governments, you know, if there's a concerted effort at driving employment um, uh, and being able to kind of uh, make those investments, I think that's certainly possible. Um, and, you know, I can't comment on the Biden policy largely because, you know, we don't know what, um, uh, you know, what the state and local implications might be, what the congressional appropriation is going to look like, you know, what the actual rules and regulations of, of a potential uh, Biden administration might look like. Um, what I will say, generally speaking, is that um, it is, you know, uh, very, very possible to kind of create economic development, uh, as I mentioned, in localized regions, uh, particularly around industries that are of strategic national interest. Um, you know, uh, you look at places like um, uh, Southeast Asia, China, you know, Europe and, and the like that really have been able to target uh, public sector resources into creating um, you know, jobs. Um, and I think that, that uh, it really just takes lead, uh, effective leadership um, and vision for uh, not only the country, but for local communities uh, to be able to kind of have that, um, that coordination to make possible. Thank you very much for that answer. The another question we have so far uh, is from an anonymous attendee and that asks about uh, the following question. At fiscal note, how do you navigate possible clients who may want to use your technology for purposes that will most likely have a net negative impact on the majority of people. Uh, examples that the attendee gives are such as governments with history of stunting rights, uh, fossil fuel companies, et cetera. So, you know, at Fiscal Note, um, we do have a pretty strict set of um, ethical standards um, that, that we abide by. We have a, an ethics committee, a bipartisan ethics committee um, that effectively reviews um, all of our clients coming in. Any, any uh, employee or, or whatnot across our ecosystem can effectively flag an individual company. Um, and, uh, and we can kind of go into an ethical review. What I will say is that the majority of, of ethical flags that we've kind of put on the, on the playing field uh, have related to um, race relations um, or, um, you know, hate groups um, or, uh, uh, organizations that uh, we feel are not conducive to our mission um, of, you know, connecting the world to the governments and kind of are, you know, created for a kind of um, uh, uh, perverted purpose in some capacity. I think overall, though, um, you know, when I think about the stuff, I think about, you know, fundamentally, it just goes back to our mission, which is to connect the world to their governments. And, you know, people can have reasonable disagreements on policy. Um, and political ideology. I don't think it's our um, role to kind of play arbiter, you know, to, um, you know, who's right and who's wrong. I think if you're a legitimate participant of democracy and you want to act, you want to access legislation and regulations and the political ecosystem to do so, um, then, you know, it's, it's part of our mission to essentially allow people to participate in the democratic process, um, you know, to have the information at their fingertips uh, and be able to, um, you know, make their voices heard. Um, and, uh, you know, there's certainly a lot of political opinions that I personally disagree with. Uh, but, you know, I will, uh, as, a, as an individual, make sure that their voices are heard um, and that they are able to participate in the democratic process. And that's something that I feel very strongly about, um, uh, you know, a, as part of the, the mission of our business. I want to pivot towards a personal question that I want to ask. Um, this undergraduate committee of global thought is, as its name uh, says, is primarily uh, addressed towards the undergraduate students at Columbia University. And the future that uh, you painted is 
not that much of an optimistic future in a sense of where it is possible that people lose their jobs to automation. There will be a lot of some possible political unrest coming out of it. So in light of the maybe not so optimistic future, one might be the ways where the undergraduate students who are now thinking of entering into the workforce, who are now thinking of becoming a full-time, having a full-time career, et cetera, need to know before they actually make that jump to a full-time career. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, I think candidly, you know, for for students, um, you know, of the caliber that kind of go to, you know, places like Columbia or, or Princeton or, or whatnot, um, you know, the nature of employment um, is, is never going to be like a huge uh, uh, issue. Um, I mean, I think, you know, what, what, what I've seen over, you know, kind of the, the couple of, I, you know, I don't have a lot of experience to be honest, <laughs> uh, but what I can say is that, um, um, you know, what I've seen from my colleagues kind of coming out of undergrad, uh, you know, many of them of course go into the traditional industries like, um, you know, banking, consulting, um, uh, you know, many of them go into law or, or uh, you know, medicine or, or academia. Um, and, you know, in particularly in many of those industries, um, there's certainly a lot of disruption happening, um, but I don't think that the industries themselves are going to get disrupted, right? So, you know, in our space, um, look, there's always going to be, a, 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 you know, in the, in the legal space, a place for, you know, Kirkland and, you know, Latham and Skadden and, and all those folks, um, you know, in the finance world, you know, there's certainly a lot of disruption happening in the, in the financial markets, um, you know, less in terms of volatility, but more in terms of, you know, fintech and, and the like, um, uh, you know, uh, but fundamentally, you're still going to have Bank of America, you're still going to have Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan. Um, the same thing goes for, you know, medicine and, and so on and so forth. So I think, um, um, you know, uh, one of the, the pieces of advice that you know, a couple of my mentors gave me when I was coming out of undergrad um, was uh, that, you know, in the late 90s, when um, the internet was kind of taking place, certainly you had like the Amazons and the Googles and whatnots of the world kind of come up and, 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 and come up through the ranks and really build great companies. And that's great. Um, uh, you know, if you have the entrepreneurial bug and, and, you know, you feel like you can kind of go after it, um, then I think there's no, no, no better time to be creative and kind of go after it and, and really seek that opportunity. That being said, I mean, not everyone has to be an entrepreneur. Um, and the piece of advice that I was given essentially was that, you know, um, going back to the late nineties, um, you know, many companies and industries kind of bifurcated themselves, um, you know, to kind of, uh, pre-internet and post-internet. Um, so, you know, for the people that really got the internet, um, that really understood the, the opportunity for global connectivity, um, and what the opportunities that presented, um, those are the people that really, uh, propelled and, and skyrocketed in their careers. Um, and these are the people that, you know, imagine you're in uh, medicine and the ability to essentially use cutting edge technologies to deliver, uh, you know, new forms of, of healthcare. Or if you're in energy and, and really thinking about how, you know, the internet could be used for, you know, a variety of different purposes, like, you know, monitoring pipelines and, and so on and so forth, right? So that, that cutting edge of innovation, um, and really understanding technology, um, you know, I think is, is going to be key, you know, over the course of the next couple of, of, uh, you know, decades. And it's no secret that, um, if you read the financial statements or, you know, the press releases or whatnot of, uh, most companies right now, I would say there's not a single leading company that doesn't consider themselves a technology company. Um, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what sector you're in, you know, if you're in banking or in energy and healthcare or, logistics or, you know, transportation, you know, every single leading company in each of those industries, um, uh, you know, considers themselves a technology business. Um, and that's just the era that we're living in. And so, um, you know, it's better to be on the cutting edge and, and to really think about, you know, how you can make a, a, the most impact in, in any, in whatever sector or field you go into. And speaking of the topic of disruption, uh, I wanted to uh, mention, uh, a field that you yourself are disrupting, and that is uh, in the journalism. Uh, the fiscal note acquired roll call. Uh, and I just wanted to like ask you, 
as an entrepreneur, when you decide to uh, acquire a newspaper, which is a newspaper business, which is now considered to be, like the whole industry is considered to be in a very shaky ground. What was the, the opportunity you saw in such an acquirement? Well, I mean, fundamentally, you know, fiscal note, we're in the information business. Um, so we uh, collect large amounts of things that are happening in the government. Um, could be, you know, the FCC ruling on some new thing or Congress trying to pass some budget or whatever it is. Um, we package all that up and then we sell it to customers. That's how, basically how we sell. We, we, we build our business, right? We consider ourselves like the, the Bloomberg terminal, you know, for what government is doing and for what law is. Um, and so, um, we felt very strongly that the opportunity to kind of take that data, um, and repackage it into, um, you know, additional products, particularly in the media space was, was very possible, um, and, uh, could form the basis for a new business model, um, you know, around, um, you know, information and data and artificial intelligence. And, um, that's basically kind of what, what it came down to is that we kind of had this thesis. Um, we had this opportunity to kind of um, take what we did and make it better and scale it out even more. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I would say that largely that bet has paid off. Um, and so you know, we're very happy about, um, you know, the consolidation with CQ Roll Call and, you know, how that uh, has been able to kind of leverage some of the skill sets and core competencies that we have. Yeah, I got another audience question asking about how concerned are you with deep fakes and what is their threat to democracy? That's a bit a uh, different topic than we've been talking so far, but it, I think it goes along with how democracy, uh, AI could disrupt uh, not only businesses, also democratic processes as well. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to the first topic that I was talking about, right, which is around misinformation. And, you know, um, misinformation is you know, extremely uh, pernicious uh, because, you know, you're basically looking at, um, you know, ways of kind of fundamentally dismantling the basis for civil argument. Um, you know, it's one thing if you're saying, um, you know, basically you have to, you have to argue around the facts. And um, I think that, you know, where um, things like deep fakes are, are the most um, challenging um, are places where um, people lean on authority uh, to be able to do uh, certain things, right? So um, uh, a good example, this might be the concept of wearing masks, right? So, you know, imagine uh, the use of deep fakes to um, create a misinformation campaign uh, by you know, everyone from Dr. Fauci to every member of Congress, basically parroting, um, you know, a phrase around not needing to wear masks. Um, you know, that's extremely dangerous um, in terms of the role of, of the public sector, uh, in terms of the authority that they provide um, and the expertise that they provide as well. Um, uh, but even, you know, down to the levels of things like um, medical disinformation. Um, and so, uh, you know, in terms of pharmaceuticals and, 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 and whatnot. So I, I do think that um, there needs to be significant regulation, um, you know, in terms of how we leverage some of the stuff. And it, a lot of people say, oh, that's a restriction on free speech, blah, blah, blah. But in reality, you know, we do restrict free speech quite a bit in this country. Um, you know, that's the reason why you can't uh, yell fire in, the, in a crowded movie theater. Um, you know, there's certain restrictions on our free speech, um, you know, that enable us to participate in a, a, in a free and fair democracy. Um, and, uh, and it's up to us effectively to kind of create those regulatory regimes. Okay, I, you know, I've been having a, quite a lot of questions now about uh, social media platforms uh, and the limit of free speech in a technological world. So let me try to group a lot of questions into in like one big uh, question. So one audience says that many tech companies fall in the temptation of editorializing their content, their data, but also to limit free speech while enjoying the privilege of immunity from lawsuits just because they were supposed to provide free speech platforms. Uh, do you fall in that temptation? And what do you think of Twitter and Facebook limiting free speech? Uh, another question asked by uh, our member, David, is also, 
what are your views on Twitter and Facebook's current rules on managing misinformation? Yes. So I think that uh, a lot of our, our audiences are very curious about the aspects of social media and what the role and responsibilities are in the 21st century. Yeah. Um, editorializing by, uh, you know, it's it, so, so philosophically it depends what you, what you believe, um, uh, uh, you know, our social media companies to be, are they town squares, um, you know, where, um, you know, people are able to kind of get up on top of a box and kind of scream what they want? Um, or are they closer to um, news organizations uh, where they have an opportunity to be able to kind of um, present their individual views? Um, and I would say that depending on where you fall on that spectrum, whether you believe um, Facebook is, is closer to, Facebook and Twitter are closer to a, a town square, um, you know, so basically something like email, um, or you believe that there's something closer to a, uh, a Fox News or an MSNBC, um, you know, uh, you, you kind of have the political belief essentially of kind of where, where things stand. Um, I don't think that, you know, a lot of the social media companies, I think the social media companies do try very hard to, to try and walk a line. I, I think, um, you know, I, I don't think that there's anyone sitting in, a, in, in any of these companies trying to dictate, you um, the ideologies of what people want to see. I think they are in a very tough position uh, because there's, there is a lot of misinformation um, and their platforms are being used for nefarious purposes. Um, so, uh, you know, when it comes to, you know, what is the role of, of uh, regulations and, you know, how do we shape that, that, that free speech and conversation? I, I think that that's an open conversation that the American public needs to have about what limitations um, or not that they're willing to accept, you know, on our platforms, right? Certainly, we don't want our platforms to be, uh, you know, uh, especially if they're kind of viewed more as town squares, um, you know, places where people are, um, uh, where, where they kind of devolve into, you know, large points of, of uh, uh, you know, non-civility, um, you know, hate speech, um, and the like, where, or 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 points, large points of uh, misinformation um, that are antagonistic to democratic principles. Uh, but at the same time, you know, similar to the question, you know, we don't want um, you know limitation of free speech. It's a very fine line to walk. Um, and uh, uh, you know, um, there are smarter minds than me who can come up, can currently certainly come up with regulatory frameworks. But um, it's something that that certainly is is should be in a, a, up for conversation right now. Okay, um, and uh, yeah, yeah, no, go ahead. Anything else you want to? Yeah, okay. Um, now, uh, since we have about like five minutes, five minutes left, uh, I'll ask one final question. Uh, it's that uh, given the business model of major social media networks, do you think it is possible to have a fair democracy without individual rights, uh, in, without individual data rights slash portability? As in, do you think that the, the current business model of social media and their social media uh, companies are compatible with the idea of privacy and data rights. Under the current business model, no. Um, I mean, you know, when you peel back the onion around um, you know, what Google and Facebook and, and whatnot fundamentally are, I mean, in Twitter and to a certain extent, um, they are, they're stock markets for your attention. Um, so they have, um, the way that these businesses work is they buy and sell, you know, minutes or, or, or blocks of, of space on your, on your monitors. Basically, you know, people kind of compete, you know, brands competing for your attention. Um, you know, Google's, entire advertising business, you know, is basically this, right? They're just competing, you know, for your attention based off the data that you give them. Um, so um, do I think, you know, under the current business models that it's possible to have individual data rights? Um, you know, I think it's, it's uh, unless you shift to uh, a business model where 
you know, you're looking at, you know, uh, a paid model or something like that, which I don't think is going to be the case. Um, you know, it's going to be very difficult to do, um, to sustain even these platforms, um, you know, on a profitable and, and commercial basis. Um, and, um, I don't, I also don't think, you know, the answer is for governments to nationalize them. I think they need to be independent, privately run, um, you know, uh, sustainable. Uh, but I don't think that it's going to be possible under the current business regimes. Um, and then there's a quick question. I know that those are just above that, which is around, um, Congress routinely operating on a more decentralized basis. So, um, there's a lot of institutional processes, um, you know, that come from, uh, uh, you know, people being, you know, uh, in person. Um, we have a, we have a capital for a reason. Um, our members of Congress go to, uh, the Capitol and they meet with each other and they debate with each other, sit in committee hearings with each other for a reason. Um, I think that, uh, decentralizing, you know, uh, you know, the congressional operations through remote voting, through, you know, remote committee hearings fully, um, would, would be a big disservice to our democratic processes. Um, and would probably result in even more uh, fragmentation of our current political system. Um, so I wouldn't encourage it. Um, I think there's a lot of people who are against it in the long term. Um, and I, I, I'm not, uh, that being said, I mean, you never know with COVID and, and kind of what the long term repercussions on processes and systems look like. Okay, thank you so much. I think that kind of wraps up our session for today. Uh, there are a couple of questions left, but in the interest of time, I don't think we could, we could answer them right now. Uh, I just want to thank you, Mr. Tim Huang, for coming to our UCGT event today. Um, the, the topics that we discussed are very relevant uh, considering the upcoming election we have and also that it's going to affect a lot of our lives. So I just want to thank you for coming for our event today. And I just want to like also thank uh, David and Andrew of the UCGT who helped uh, plan this event as well. For those who came, uh, if you want to get involved in the Undergraduate Committee of Global Thought or want to learn more about its upcoming uh, events, I actually attached a link to our website on the group chat. So if you want to take a look, please do so. Uh, Tim, do you have any like final comments you want to make? No, I appreciate everybody uh, listening in. Um, and certainly, you know, uh, we're 14 days from what will be a very interesting election. So hopefully, uh, you know, if you can, everybody will go out and vote. Thank you very much. All right. Have a Thanks good day. A lot,